think about it, pray about it. You won't be uh, disappointed if you go, I promise. We're going to go and take our son and uh, just love people. Uh, preach this sermon this morning, and uh, probably one of the more unpopular sermons I've ever preached. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> But uh, one of the most important sermons I've ever preached. We all have something in common. And uh, if you want to admit it or not, some of us are more dogmatic than others about this. But we want to be right. I don't think anybody takes pleasure or uh, gets joy out of being wrong. Nobody brags about being wrong, you know. Uh, you miss a bunch of questions on a test or something. You don't like to brag to your friends. Hey, I missed 19 out of 20. Yes. You know, everybody wants to be right. And when it comes to an issue, not only do we want to be right, we want everybody else to know that we're right. And we want to rub it in their faces that us being right also equates to the fact that you are wrong. You know, and we want to and we'll lovingly do that, you know, just to let people know we're right. Uh, Jen and I have been having fun this year. We're doing a lot of pre-marriage counseling right now. And uh, I think we're marrying five couples this summer. And we've been recounting through some of the early stages of our marriage, sharing some of the many scars that we've incurred uh, along the way. And one of them where I'm going to share with you today with my wife's permission that she gave me uh, yesterday. And uh, when we first got married, we had a big issue over who's right. Over who carries the checkbook. Okay, now I know that totally is an irrelevant argument now because nobody carries checks anymore. So obviously it wasn't that big of an issue, you know, but my God. Goodness, it was such a huge issue then. Uh, now, with all loving respect towards my better half, uh, when we got married, she explained to me her system of accounting with her checkbook. And here was her methodology. She didn't log half the stuff she spent. And when she did log stuff, she would round up just to assume that she always had something in the account. And she explained this to me, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's not how I do things. Let me show you the right way on how you're supposed to keep a checkbook. Amen. And uh, I would get the statement, that's before we had internet banking back in the Stone Ages, but I would get the statement, and I would go through every line of my check, and I'd reconcile, and I'd put a check mark by everything that's on the, uh, the statement. And now that we have internet banking, thank God, I get to do that every morning. So I get up, I drink my coffee, I get online at my internet banking, and I reconcile everything that's there. I can tell you to the penny exactly how much is in my checking account. By the way, it's never much. But I can tell you to the penny. And if I'm one penny off, I'll spend an hour going back through that checking book and making sure... Uh, Crystal, you're looking at me like I'm a weirdo. Or are you? Okay, it's your husband too. Uh, so I'll find that penny, and then I'll go through every marking since then until it's exactly perfect with what the bank says I have in my account. And by the way, most of the time it's right. You know, there's very few mistakes in there. And we got married, and we had this argument over who's going to keep the checkbook. Well, obviously, my way is superior. You know, in my way, it's the right way. It's obviously the way if Jesus had a checkbook, that's how he would keep a checkbook. And I told my wife, this is the right way. And she battled with, no, I'm right. And I'm like, I don't see how you could plausibly in your mind say that your system is the right way. You're wrong. And... I didn't have the wisdom as a young married man to jump off the tracks. Just like, you know, let it go. I jumped on like a freight train, baby, and I'm going to just roll down the tracks. I'm right, you're wrong. Let me tell you, this went on for a 
year. We had a wonderful first year of marriage. It was, it was just so awesome. Uh, and then she would ask me weird things like, just give me a check out of the back of the checkbook. I'm like, what are you, communist or something? I mean, we, we don't get things out of order. You know, they're in perfect order. And like, 1185 will be followed by 1186 in my register because that's how you count. I don't know if you went to school or not, but that's how things go. And uh, I better back it up just a little bit. Uh, but this argument got intense. And there was one night in particular, and it always happens on Sunday. If you're a married couple, what is it about Sundays? They're like a breeding ground for arguments. I don't know what they are. It just happens. So uh, we were going to church on a Sunday night, and we had an argument about the checkbook. And then we go into church, and, oh, God bless you, brother. It's so good to see you. Hallelujah, sister. Welcome to the house of the Lord. You know, and we've just spent the last hour just beating each other up, just black and blue with our words, you know. And I know no other couples have ever done We finally got over that. We haven't done that in like 18 years. But we go to church, and, you know, it's just worshiping. la di da di da di da We love Jesus. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Richie, what do you love more? Your checkbook, your way, or your wife? Well, it didn't take me long to answer. I'm like, it's kind of like Peter. You love me? You know, I'm like, I love my wife the most. He wasn't done with me. He said, give her the checkbook. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, behind me, Satan. This is not you, Lord. This is not you. You just couldn't get away from it, and he kept pushing, you know, give her the checkbook. Which one do you love more? And then I'm like, God, she's going to do it wrong. And he's like, give her the checkbook. I'm like, God, okay. So I go, my wife's at the altar praying because she was so much better of a person than I was. And I was back there wrestling with God, and she's up here just thinking. And I come up and I get this checkbook out of my pocket. And I don't know why we had to carry it in our pocket at all times, you know. Like a big leather checkbook. And I come up here and tears are streaming down my face. I'm like, Chip, you can have it. I love you more. She's like, what is wrong with you? You can have the checkbook. Jesus is done with me. You can have it. I love you more. I don't want to be in control. And she looks at me, she said, Richie, I don't even want it. She said, I just don't want you to control me. Like, okay. A year. I'm right. No. I'm right. I'm right. You know, why do we do stuff like that? Why do we feel like we have to be right. My goodness, don't even get me started on social media. Every single issue. I'm right. Everybody, please applaud me and get rid of your wrong opinions because my opinion is the right one. You know, the unfortunate thing, though, is this. It carries into our spiritual walk with Jesus. Because we want everybody else to know I'm right. You're wrong. My way is the right way. First of all, before we go there, I just want to tell you, if you're following Jesus, let me tell you, you're right. You know, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's the Lord. If you're following Jesus and standing on the word of God, you're right. But here's problem. Jesus hasn't only called us to be right. He's also called us to be redemptive. Amen. Now, let me explain what I mean. I can go around, let's just take this verse. The wages of sin is death. You know, say, uh, say he hasn't 
experienced the Lord yet. You know, he's just lost in his sins. I could go to Heath and like, Heath, the wages of sin is death. You're going to hell. In the final day, you're going to be separated with the goats, and I'm a sheep. <laughs> you are chaff. I am wheat. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. First of all, was I right? Yeah, I was. But the problem is this. Where's the redemptiveness in those statements? And the problem is, we have as a church, not just us, the corporate body in America, spent far too much time trying to be right and convince others that we're right while completely losing the heart of redemption that Jesus carried. Guys, I'm telling you, Nobody cares if we're right. I mean, this is John Maxwell, 101 Leadership. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You know? okay. Where in the world has the redemptive heart of Jesus come through? Uh, come, blah, 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 blah. Gone to. Uh, open your Bibles to John chapter 4. Uh, this is a story I've spoken out of so much over the years, but there's one part in particular I really want to focus on. The woman at the well. Uh, Jesus has encountered this lady, you know, and she is, I, I don't know exactly what's happened. Either she's super promiscuous or she uh, has terrible choice in men, you know, or she's hard to live with. I don't know which one of these is true, but she's been married five times and now she's shacked up with somebody. So this is an interesting story. And she's a Samaritan woman at that. And Jesus encounters her at the well. And let's pick it up in verse 16. Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right. In saying that you don't have a husband, you've had five. And the one whom you have now is not your husband. What have you what you said is true. And she says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, she goes into this who's right discussion. He's like, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. It happened to be called Gerizim. Our fathers worshipped on Mount Gerizim. But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place who needs to, where we need to worship. Who's right? Are you right? Am I right? Hey, now, I know this is kind of distant for our thoughts, because we don't live in Israel, obviously, and we're not dealing with Samaritans every day. But think about the people that you do encounter every day. And they try to just pull you into these conversations of who's right. Is this right or is this right? Now, first of all, I want to tell you, we never need to compromise truth. Because the moment we find ourselves opposing truth, we really miss the heart. But... Here's the issue. Jesus refuses to get into that conversation. Look what he says. He says, woman, he's the only one that can get away with addressing a lady as woman. I am scared to death to read that. <laughs> woman! <laughs> Whoa, not me. Believe me, the hour is coming when it's not going to be about this mountain or it's not going to be about this mountain. So let's just get past the whole who's right conversation, okay? And he says, we worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. Salvation is from the Jews. The hour is now coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Amen. All of a sudden, Jesus is like, Let's not talk about this who's right conversation. And he turns into this redemptive conversation all of a sudden. He's like, it's not about that. Can we just get past who's right, you know? Can we get past if we're supposed to have music and worship or if we're supposed to take up an offering with a bag or with a plate or people walk up front or boxes in front or on? Who's right? Can we get past, like, what worship songs we're supposed to sing Who's right? It's not about that. And the lady says, well, obviously he caught her attention. Because he says, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus says, 
I who speak to you am he, or Snoop Dogg would say, I am he. <laughs> I am he. Sorry. For Snoop Dogg reference, you've heard the sermon in a long time, I promise you. <laughs> he is I and I am him. Um, I'm so stupid. <laughs> Just then, the disciples came back. They marveled that he was saying something to a woman. Whom do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So here's the key point. Look at this. The woman left her water jar. See, if I'm not mistaken, we're called to be salt. We're called to reach a world for Jesus. And our goal is is to go love people with the love of Christ and get them to leave over here and come over here in our camp and have this relationship with Christ. Look at this. He meets her at a well in her lifestyle right here. And instead of being drawn into this who's right conversation, all of a sudden he goes into this redemptive analogy. It's like, hey, it's not about that. I'm the Messiah and I'm giving you a chance to have a relationship with and all of a sudden, she's like, I don't want this anymore. And she leaves that, and she goes. Let me ask you a question. Would she have ever left that water jar if Jesus would have engaged her with just truth and not redemption? I mean, this conversation could have been so different. Well, which mountain are we supposed to worship on? Garrison or Jerusalem? He's like, peasant woman? You're a Samaritan. I'm a G. You know Jerusalem's the place to worship. And let me tell you why Gerizim is the worst mountain in the world. You laugh, but how many times have Christians engaged unbelievers just like that? You shouldn't think like that. That's so stupid. You're wrong. Oh, they're really going to just crave that Jesus that you're serving at that point, you know? And... <laughs> And then we say, well, the truth hurts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus is proud of you for your attitude to me. Just, <laughs> yay, Richie. Way to go. But he doesn't get into that. He doesn't say, you know, the wages of sin is death. You've been with five guys and now you're shacked up. Psh, psh, whoops. <laughs> <That's scary. laughs> what in the world? And all of a sudden, she leaves her place and goes away into the town where the people came. And she's, she's all of a sudden a Jesus follower. Come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. I think he's the Messiah. And if you look down in verse 39, it gets even better. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Good grief. How? See, here's what the Lord's been speaking to me for quite some time now. The church would explode if we were to recapture that heart. And why isn't the church growing? Because we're a bunch of jerks. And we've missed the heart of Jesus. And instead of being these redemptive people working for a redemptive God, all of a sudden we're arrogant jerks that wants everybody to know that we're right. You're not ever going to win anybody like that. See, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's not the arrogance of Christians. It's not the, the truth. All right. I told you this is not a popular sermon. Here's what we need to do. There's another verse in Luke chapter 19. And this is so cool. I used to preach on this story all the time. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. On Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Chris loves that. He's heard Zacchaeus many times. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He just sounds so fun like a child. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. Oh, sorry. Where are these voices coming from? <laughs> Little known fact that Zacchaeus was actually Scottish. That's the only time he said we, you know. 
He was a wee little man. He climbed up that tree, not in all that. Uh, these are free things. It has nothing to do with the sermon. It's for your entertainment whatsoever. Hallelujah. So, he entered Jericho. <coughs> See, isn't it? It's a church one. He entered Jericho and was passing through in verse 1 of chapter 19 of Luke. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now, here's the truth about Zacchaeus. He was a traitor to his country. And he was the chief tax collector. Doesn't that sound like a fun conversation to get into? That's awesome. So you've got this chief tax collector. And he's seeking Jesus to see who he was. But on the count of a crowd, he couldn't get through because he was small of stature. He was a tiny man. He was a wheel of mine. So he ran ahead and climbed up in a tree where he was about to pass that way. Now think about it. A man that everything inside of you, you disagree with. See, here's the place we've gotten at today. We can't even sit in the same room of someone that's standing on an opposing side of something. Honestly, I think that says more about you than it does about that person. You mean we, we've lost common decency? You know that we, I mean, I can, I know what I believe. And I, I can engage somebody <coughs> in a conversation that's engaged in something that makes me want to vomit. Because I love them. These people are there, and Jesus is like, Hey, come down from the tree. I'm coming to your house. And all of a sudden, oh boy, it's on. Religious people heard this. Zacchaeus hurried down, but when the crowd saw it, this verse is awesome, they grumbled. He's going to be the guest of the sinner. <laughs> Because Jesus won't be teaching Sunday school at this church anymore. It's so silly. These voices are terrible. Jesus. Go to Zacchaeus' house? Good grief. Don't you know what he is and what he stands for? <coughs> Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I'll give away. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'm going to give to him fourfold what I took. And Jesus said, Salvation has come to your house today, son. He was the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And all it took, now, some people would say, well, you compromised yourself by going there. What you behold is what you become. Bad company corrupts good morals. Stay away. Well, that's interesting. Now, we should never compromise truth. And honestly, there's some places we probably shouldn't go. But, why do we spend so much time being We've lost redemption. Jesus had dinner at a man's house. And people are on the outside just sick to their stomach that he's on the inside. It doesn't show anything that Jesus said. Just by Jesus engaging him in love. Coming to the man's house and sitting down. Maybe Jesus is eating soup. And maybe nothing has been spoken. But because he has loved him enough to grace him with his presence and not just be sickened at his presence, all of a sudden this man just feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit and says, hey, whatever I've stolen, I'll give it back. If it's mine, I'll give it back fourfold. I'll give away everything I have, Jesus. Yes, yes, amen. Did Jesus compromise himself by going there? Yes. Huh, interesting. Well, I think oftentimes... We would be in that place. It's like, well, let me sit down and tell you why your tax brackets are wrong. That's not how it's supposed to go. A flat tax is the right way, Zacchaeus. Who cares? 
Redemption, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. We need to have these redemptive relationships and remain humble and stand for what is right. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. It's just one verse I want to talk about. But it says this. Paul's talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, trying to get his heart in him. And he says, hey, no soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Because his job is to please the one who enlisted him. That's interesting. See, to me, see, this is where people start getting mad in the sermon. We are too entangled in civilian affairs. Turn on Facebook, have a conversation with a Christian. I've heard way more vehemence and passion this last month over a wall on our southern border than I have people trying to reach people for the love of Jesus. See, I told you it doesn't get fun from here on out. <laughs> Build the wall! Kick him out! I'm not talking about a wall. I'm not getting entangled in civilian affairs because I'm called to redeem mankind from the curse through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, I told you it's not possible. But all along, I'm right! I'm right! Do it! <laughs> you know I'm telling the truth. Why are we spending our passion on things that are not kingdom focused? You know, I hate abortion as much as anybody does. It's a smear. And I believe and know life begins at conception. But I don't just want that eradicated in this country. I want to see redemption happen. Yes. I want to see Jesus come in and say, yes. let me take care of this. Let me heal people that have walked through this process. Yes. Yes. See, but we'd rather be bright than be redemptive. I think in every situation we find ourselves in, our prayer needs to be, Lord, how do you want to redeem this? How can I help? But oftentimes that's not. Like, no, nah, you're wrong. Stay away. Get out of this country. We're a Christian nation. See, now I'm starting to step on toes. Where's redemption? Where's the love of Jesus? I tell you what, that homosexual community is just standing against the church. Let me tell you something about that community. Jesus hung naked on a cross for that community, and he loves them just as much as he loves you. The people that blew up buildings that wear turbans on their head, Jesus loves them and died for them just like he did for you. And he does not care more about you than he does about them. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Get them out. No. Jesus paid the price to redeem mankind from the curse. But we'd rather be right then we would rather be redemptive. I think it grieves the heart of Jesus. See, his plan, now I know it's a shoddy plan. He chose us. And we've done a shoddy job. But man, his heartbeat is for the nations. His heartbeat is for lost mankind. He didn't say, I'll tell you what, married five times, get out of my presence, woman. See, the new voices are coming, they're just terrible. It's not what he did. He just embraced her with love. So let, me, let me show you something. Let me show you who I really am. Here's the truth, guys. Mankind is desperate for an encounter with Christ. Some of them just don't even know it. And we have sickened them and turned them against the church by our attitudes. My goodness. Nicodemus.
Nicodemus, the chapter before. Oh, this is great. Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John says, uh, he was a Pharisee, the ruler of the Jews. Let me tell you what he was. That's a political party in Israel. Oh boy, this is going to be fun. He comes to Jesus and says, hey, you must be from God because there's some pretty awesome miracles coming from you. Look what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say, well, Democrat, I mean Pharisee, let me show you why you're wrong. Let's talk about your political party stances and let me show you why you're wrong on every one of them. He didn't address what the Pharisees stood for at all. He didn't try to disarm him by being smarter than him. Jesus' first words to Nicodemus was this. Hey, buddy, you got to pick the word again. You mean you don't want to argue like the scribes do with me or the Sadducees? You don't want to get into a political argument here? Too? Nicodemus, let's forget all that. You just got to be born again. What is that? <laughs> That's having the right heart. See, Jesus was a master of being right and being redemptive. He never compromised truth, but he engaged each person with love. And it didn't matter who they are, what they had done, what they had stood for. Once again, look at the modern comparison. We can't sit in a room with somebody that disagrees with us without feeling the need to show them why we're God, why have we forsaken you? And we're never going to reach lost mankind like that. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. And if we let his goodness flow through us and his love abide in us, we don't compromise truth. I'm not saying that. Stand on the side of truth but have a heart of redemption, and you'll see the greatest revival the world has ever seen. Now, I'm not against street preaching at all, but oftentimes they'll just stand here and yell in people's faces, you're going to hell! Oh, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Where's the message of hope? See, the gospel is good news. It's good news. And we've got to be redemptive. I told you, I'm losing friends left and right. This is not popular, but it's true. Look at our Savior. Think about him walking down a road to be crucified. Pulling his own cross. Beaten beyond recognition. Crown of thorns on his head. And they finally lay him on a cross. And they put nails through his feet and his hands. And they erect him up above the earth. Even at that point, while he's gasping for breath, there's some soldiers down there, and they're like, hey, let's use some craps for his clothes. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, guys, you're wrong. By the way, I'm a son of God. Let me show you why you're wrong. He said words that are reverberating across history even now. He looks down on them and just says, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. It's not a big deal, Lord. Forgive them, Father. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Where is that heart in the church? Where is that heart for lost humanity? And the last question. Who is your woman at the well? Who is your Zacchaeus? Who is your Nicodemus? Who slips away to you and just says, hey, I am the truth. They're waiting for us to have a heart of redemption to reach them.
about you. I can't put this on you, but I can put it on me. I have wasted so much of my life being right. Or at least thinking I was right. And so little of my life being redemptive. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you. There's encounters every single day. Encounters with people every day, and you never know who people are. <coughs> Ever. I'm waiting for somebody to be redemptive that can see through the junk that they're expressing. Stop being so offended about everybody's lifestyles. Engage them with the love of Jesus. Yes, amen. Well, all they do, they're just a partier. I don't want nothing to do. Well, that's going to really reach them. Show them the love of Christ. Somebody asked me last week, well, what would you do if an illegal immigrant moved in next to you? I would invite them over for dinner and tell them about Jesus. Yes, amen. That's what I would do. Why can't we love people with Jesus' love? All right. I think I just lost my last breath. <laughs> Father, as we come before you today, as hard as this has been to carry, Lord, Lord, I'm not angry at anyone here. I'm just expressing what you've spoken to me this week, Jesus. I feel like collectively, though, Lord, I'm not the only one. Lord, I have spent so much time being right, Lord. God, Lord, I've lost a heart. Lord, I've been offended at people. Lord, I've been turned off. I've tried to express why I'm right. And meanwhile, each day, Lord, people apart from you, Lord, they spend a Christless eternity in hell knowing that I was right. Because I made sure they knew. But I never had that heart of redemption. God, forgive me. Forgive us. May our hearts be like the soldier that Paul was talking about. Lord, our aim is to please the one that enlisted us. Not be so entangled with things, try to prove we're right. should be humble. Lord, we're speaking and we should be quiet. Lord, we're hating when we should be loving. And we're rejecting when we should be embracing. But the mission is very, very clear. Go. Go. What the truth is, with most of our attitudes, we should stay. Or clean us up and then send us.
we're not ready. We don't know how to engage a lost world apart from you with your love. Help us, Jesus. Lord, there's a woman at the well every day waiting to leave her jar. Waiting to run and tell every friend that she had, hey, I was this. And I encountered something real. Somebody loved me. And I left it. Jesus, forgive us. How many women are still sitting in a well more when we were supposed to pick them up? Nothing wrong with being right. I want you to be right. We need to be redemptive. We need to see through to the heart of the issue. And we need to expend our passion, all of our passion, on loving the least of these. I challenge you this week engage people with a redemptive heart. Every situation you find yourself in, ask Jesus, how are you wanting to redeem this situation? Use me, Lord, and give me your heart. I promise you, it will revolutionize your life and revolutionize this church from the core. I love you guys very much. If anybody needs further prayer, we'll be out hanging out at the altar this afternoon. Love you guys. We'll see you next week about 3 o'clock. Great to gather.